to respond and if you have a thought uh, that's fine if you have a question that's fine a comment but we invite our gathered assembly here to uh, respond to Bishop McElroy's remarks um, first of all thank you um, for that I really appreciate it um, but I just have a question um, something that you mentioned is that the Catholic imagination cannot be broken down into one party or the other um, which I agree, but realistically speaking, um, thinking about our last election, a lot of people have the viewpoint that a third party vote was a throwaway, um, and was in a way like taking the side of the oppressor. Um, and so I'm wondering how you believe a Catholic imagination can function in what is pretty much a two party system right now. I think that the fundamental stance is that a Catholic political imagination is prior to any specific choice. That it is an orientation. It seeks to build up a type of culture politically in society so that the common good can be pursued. That is the, the more important priority, and it, it pre-existed. And uh, it's always going to be hard in political choice in the United States or in any election. That is, I, I, I cast my first vote in 1972 uh, um, when I was 18 years old. Um, and every election since then, I remember many of us have felt there's not much, they're, they're not good choices. So that will always be true. But what's happened, I think, that's much beyond the particular electoral choices people make is that uh, they have imbued party and, and the division between the two parties and the whole set of uh, factors which lay beyond that, which are class and race and faith and patriotism, all these different sorts of issues, that they have imbued that with a sense of right and wrong and black and white. And that's, that's corrosive, I believe, to our country. So my argument really is that um, what we need to build up is a, is, is a spirit of what it means to be, uh, to pursue the common good and have an orientation toward doing that. In every election, there are going to be hard choices over who do you vote for. And in the end, they'll be unsatisfying for, for the most part. But uh, I think that w the minute we buy into the starting point being we have a choice between, uh, you know, uh, Clinton and Trump, or we have a, we have a, a choice between, uh, you know, uh, Clinton and Obama, and uh, you know these different ones. Uh, the minute we start there, we've lost, because we should start out with saying, what, what type of Christian should we be developing, to be in the world to make the world a better place. If we always start out with the limiting moment, which you're right to point, that's, that is, that's the hard part. That's where the rubber hits the road. It's very hard. But if we start there, then we've already lost, I think. But we, be, because there used to be a much wider expanse of conversation in society on these things. And that has diminished. Now, when I say there was a wide, there was also, you know, uh, in prior ages, uh, much more volatile racism and, and you know, sex, all these different, those were true too. So this was not like in the old days things were so much better. But, but, but the idea of conversation, the idea of dialogue, the, the difference that poll cites between 5% people saying, I'd be upset if my son or daughter married a whatever, and 40, that is stark. That, is, that, that, that really says something that's much more in depth. So, uh, anyway, that's, but it doesn't relieve the dilemma you're pointing to. I agree with that. I think, it, uh, you know, if we don't, we don't recognize that, uh, we're, we're, as you say, it's a great Since the Citizens United case. It's a grave challenge. I was very sorry. 
that case was decided that way. Um, although I'm not even sure if it had been decided the other way, there would be sufficient regulation. Money is, uh, on all sides, is, is just a corruptive. And then certain institutions have, have diminished. The, the unions that used to be so strong are less strong. So there's, there's been a, 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 a relocation of some factors uh, that are important to society. Yes. Thank you for your inspiring uh, remarks. Just to set my question up uh, with reference to the Jesus' uh, teaching, he taught the Beatitudes, which are inspirational, appealing to uh, basic moral dispositions spiritual dispositions. On the other hand, he called out people. He had a rhetoric against the Pharisees. It was pretty tough. What's the role of that kind of rhetoric in our political environment where we hear a lot of falsehoods from major political leaders? How does one respond to that? I think that what I'm outlining are a series of dispositions virtues that I think would be good if people, that would be really important if people approach this in politics in this way. I mean, even you're, when you're approaching this way, there's also a prophetic voice within politics that is in, can be in keeping with those things. Sometimes, for, for example, uh, you know, we're peace builders. There, there's a very interesting argument I saw by a sociologist. He's actually a conservative sociologist, but this is not a conservative point. He, he said um, there are centripetal and centrifugal forces and ways of, 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 of critiquing society fundamentally and being prophetic in society. I get mixed up. Which, which is centrifugal is what? Outward. Going outward, okay. Um, he said much of race and identity politics now is centrifugal. He said, however, if you look at what someone like Martin Luther King did, it was, an, it was prophetic, and it was a critique, and it was a powerful critique, but it was centripetal because it appealed to the very foundations of the, Na the Declaration of the and showed the shortcomings of the country and the conscience of white America, and in that way it was unifying. And so, I think there's something to that, that that prophetic voices can be centripetal. Um, and, 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 but, but again, it has to be within the spirit of, of, of dialogue and encounter. We, I, I just think unless we have a sense of encounter, um, we, I, I live in California, okay? That's a bubble in a million ways, okay? It, it really is, you know? Um, and, and, and most of us are living in various ways in bubbles too, where, where we're not we're not reading the whole world. So encounter is really important, I think, for us to get out of this current moment. I could not agree more with you that the Christian political virtues must be below or beyond partisanship. That's not what I mean. But the country has changed so much since the visit of the Pope, that I really wonder, and I really, I don't say that lightly, but I really wonder today in 2018 whether we can raise the question the same way, bringing together the country, or whether that is not taking the second step before the first. I remember we're, we're Christian ethicists, and, and shortly after the election, there was the annual meeting of the American Christian ethicists and the Black Caucus or whatever group within within the Society of Christian Ethics asked, or should I say, accused us white Christians of having let them down. Because more than 80%, I think, of the, the Protestant Christians voted for Donald Trump and more than 50% of the Catholics voted for Donald Trump. And here we were, we white, I look at my colleague Susan Ross, we were both there. We, we still grappled with the fact of that election, but we could also not agree more with our colleagues. And in a situation where you are faced not only with 
pretty blunt racism, but furthermore, with more than blunt sexism, don't we have to take a position? And I must honestly say, I often lose my hope in the Catholic Church in the US to be on the right side. Whenever I do lose my hope, however, I go to the website of the American, the, the US Catholic um, Bishops Conference and just spend half an hour on the migration issues. And then I'm really, really proud again to be a Catholic. <laughs> no, honestly, because, you know, it is it, one way or the other, but I do believe that we, that we should have the discussion this afternoon about what does it mean right now? Because this democracy, it seems to me at least, slowly but surely, is at stake. And we've had a conversation, you know where I come from. I come from Germany. And there are times when the Christian theologians like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others stood up and said, we as Christians, beyond any politics, have to take a position and raise our voices loudly. And I do not hear that. Well, uh, I would say to go back to the, the, what you first raised, are we, are we not taking the second question first? What I'm trying to say is, I think the first question is having these virtues because without them, we can't as a society begin to move toward implementing the common good. It, it, so, that, so that to me, they are a prerequisite. But they're not at all consistent with taking strong positions on things. I think none of them are consistent. I think the failures we have, if, if you look at those virtues of what I'm suggesting is, you know, getting rid of the visceral pleasure, purging that part of our lives to have, to have real integrity. Because I think we do treat this like, like sport now. It gives us some of the satisfaction. I don't want to be negative towards sports, but it gives us some of the same thrills and, and, uh, and identification of a tribe. I really, I think that's there. The same thing with compassion. We so often, I, mean, I, I, mean, I say, I'm, I'm talking about myself now, so I, I, I see myself praying on, of where my compassion falls more on some because uh, uh, I'm closer to their experience or, uh, or it falls in the other political side. That affects me too. So that um, that each of these virtues, I think, is is a prerequisite for writing our society. Now, in the once you once you begin to move toward this, you can easily, I think, practice each of those five virtues and take very strong prophetic stands of the type that you have been talking about, and and th to have dialogue. That, that is that is impassioned and uh, strong and and strongly proclaimed. I don't think those are inconsistent at all, but I think those those virtues are necessary if we're going to make progress on this. Because I, I fear a rupture and a, uh, I fear no, I'm getting out of here. Evil forces taking over in our society. That's may, may I just First of all, I really, really agree with the virtues that, that addressed here. I would think that the cardinal virtue of, of justice needs to kind of be integrated in, in the yeah. other dispositions. And there is a certain rage for justice that is as biblical <laughs> as the peacemaking. Okay, it is part of yeah. peacemaking according to the Jesuitic um, ethics. But having said that, I do believe it is fine. I agree with you 100% if you address us as persons, as individuals. However, you are a bishop. You are a member of the US Conference of Bishops, Catholic bishops. And that gives you a different role too. So there is something beyond that. There is a political role. There's an institutional role that you play. And we cannot kind of ignore that. So we all, I'm a theologian. I'm a moral theologian. I'm here at Loyola. I have a different role than merely being a parishioner in a Catholic parish or so. And you have a different role. And I was probably, pro 
probably trying to, to poke you a little bit yeah. about that role and the public role of the face of the Catholic Church. Not that I don't think we are all the church, we are. But there are different roles that we play. And what is the institutional role of the Catholic Bishops' Conference and the Catholic Church publicly, if not putting the virtue of justice first? Yeah, I, that, that's a good point. And when I, when I list these five virtues, I don't mean that's an exhaustive list. No, this is a, it's a, it's a framework and a suggestion that these, these are the sorts of elements that can move us forward. I, 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 I would wholly, the, I, I, I think I subsume justice in a sense under compassion, if you want to worry. But, but I, I take that. So I don't want anybody to think this is a taxative list. This is simply a, a, a suggestion for reflection on how, we, but, 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 but my, my, what I am more than suggesting is that I feel it is the disposition of our inner hearts and souls toward the virtue, uh, toward a set of virtues that are a prerequisite for moving toward the common good in our society. And if we move in that direction on the virtues, as I say, it is still consistent with taking strong stands on, on things and, uh, and, and proclaiming them. And, uh, and it doesn't get, that doesn't answer all the, even if we did all these five things, this wouldn't answer all our questions, but it would help set a foundation for moving more coherently to do that. You know, the, the broad middle has dropped out. And that's a, that's a loss in this society. Now, it's still there, but it, it, it you know, how, for how long now have we been in a 50-50 situation? It, you know, it, it, this is painful, you know, in terms of the election. And, and now I feel things are disintegrating. And so, anyway, there was... Sure. I, uh, with the title of your lecture, I was um, very um, hoping to hear more about the imaginative and the affective yeah. dimension. And so the virtues, of course, are very important. But I think um, even in any virtue ethic, there needs to be a kind of narrative. There needs to be a way in which we are, as you just said, we are touched. And so I wondered if you have any thoughts about the kinds of stories, yes, yeah, the uh, kinds of um, the ways in which our imaginations really can be touched because it is one thing to talk about the virtues in a kind of academic sense, but I'd, I'd really like to hear more from you sure. about that affective, that imaginative dimension. I think you put your finger right on it. Narrative is, in my experience, the way to, where I am in San Diego, immigration is such a wrenching reality. And we have parishes that we have segments of our Catholic population which disagree on immigration, all right? Now, it's a fairly strongly pro-immigrant culture in, 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 in the Diocese of San Diego, but there's still a lot of, but in my experience, narrative co conversations about people's lives, when, when you can get people together to cross the barriers, about specifically, that you, they don't begin with the issue, but they begin with the, Here's what happened when I was growing up as a kid in Mexico or Ecuador, whatever. And, and then, then, the, then the person who may be what, not so favorable to the undocumented might begin with something. I, I've seen those be so powerful. I think that's where, it, that is the most important thing to move hearts and souls, frankly, to, is when people see that in people whom they care for. We, we have people, who sometimes get very strange, but but when they encounter suffering, and that's why I don't want to push this point on compassion is compartmentalized, but that doesn't mean the people have become really hard-hearted. It means that there's a part to that, and that's that's atrophy, and that's not good. But that I've seen so often when people encounter suffering, that moves them. But it's in the concrete. So I think that's where the inspiration comes from. When you were talking about uh, the difference between the centrifugal and centrifugal forces, um, 
Were you quoting Mark Lila, the social scientist? No, I think this man's, it's like hate. Okay. H-O-E-D-T, something like that. Um, uh, but he is a sociologist. Okay. So. Um, because others have pointed to Dr. Martin Luther yes. King as a, as a counterexample to identity politics, um, which is, is, I find to be a, a problematic contrast. Um, and uh, it bothers me because Dr. King in his time was prophetic, yeah. and he has come to be a unifier. But people forget that in the 1960s, we were a highly polarized society, and Dr. King, uh, he founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference because he was kicked out of the Northern Baptist Convention, and uh, he was hounded as a communist. He was considered to be uh, deeply problematic in his own time. At the, at, in his lifetime, he was not looked upon as a unifier. It was only in death that he's been made into an icon for very good reasons. There are many others yeah. in, in their time, Daniel Berrigan, you know, um, others that we remember as being a contrast, as if there are identity politics today that divide us, whereas once upon a time we have romanticized figures that are unifying. So I would caution you yeah. against um, mythologizing historical figures as if these prophetic I'd say, at least as I've read, and I had to say, I read this the second, uh, secondary source, um, but the, the focus wasn't so much on King per se, it was on a tactic, it was a, it was a tactic. Now, and certainly your point about him being controversial at the time, especially when he went against the war, even more so, made him a more controversial figure. But what this argument is, that the tactic that King used was to um, to refer to the to the foundational aspirations of the society as a whole and show the discord between that and what the reality was. So it was it was not so much in at least as I saw the argument, as so much as about King himself as a whole, but as saying there are different ways of tactics of of pointing out terrible injustices in societies, and that the tactic of pointing to the disparity between the American Declaration of Independence and the creed, as it seeks to be and has never been fully, but as it seeks to be, is a way of, uni it, it, it's a way of unifying. And so that, I think that's, as I gather, that's what this guy says. Over here. Bishop, thank you so much for your uh, courageous and encouraging message. We have two questions, and before that, uh, I understand your conference is in the, within the frame of uh, this country. But as a Catholic bishop, uh, the first question is, if you could uh, tell us and define and expand a little bit on the concept of common good. You repeat about 15 times this sure. central concept. Especially what would be good in a global context, good and true, and what, what is common, not just for a country, but for humankind. And to put some flesh into this, uh, uh, following Dr. Rose's uh, comment, and following Paul Francis, this principles, reality is greater than ideas, to put concrete examples, how could we define common good in a global international context? Thank you. Um, common good, is talked about in Catholic teachings, it's, it's talked about, it's defined at the council and it's defined in the catechism. It has a very clunky definition, I think, because it's a complex concept, but it's, and anyone here who knows more about this than I, please add to this. It's basically the sum total of conditions in society which contribute to the integral human development of individual, of, but, but taking account everybody in the society and the society as a whole. It's an amorphous concept, but that, it, it means everybody is included uh, and no one is left out. And everyone is included in appropriate ways, 
given their situations, given their uh, how uh, leaving them out certain things will deprive them and hurt them and so forth. So it's a complex concept, but it basically means everyone is included in advancing their well-being. Now, it is, in my view, there is not just a national common good. Every society has its common good. The university here has a common good. What's the common good of well, the university, for example? What, what helps the university as a whole? Luckily, <laughs> you two can uh, figure that out. But, uh, but, but it's a complex, every society, a family has a common good. Every human society in Catholic has a common good. A country has a common good. But it has increasingly been the teaching in the church, really from John the 23rd on, that international society, particularly as it's globalized, has a common good, an international common good, which makes demands upon all members of the world society, that there is an international society. And so it, it does Catholic teaching now, I believe, is, it's moving. This is one of those elements of Catholic, Catholic youth is moving. But basically, I think clearly, I would have no hesitation in saying Catholic uh, theology teaches that there is an international common good. And that's why so many of the issues about globalization come up. How is that moving toward the common good and how is it not? And that's, the, my own view is that, that what uh, Pope uh, Francis is doing on globalization is what uh, Leo XIII did on industrialization. That is, he's critiquing the shortcomings and saying there need to be major new social structures, economic structures, to redress the deprivations that flow from globalization. But so I, I think Catholics should be clear there's an international common good that binds everybody and every nation. Thank you. We've been dialoguing very well for about 35 minutes. I think we have time for two or three more. So I do want to encourage students, I do want to encourage students to, uh, yes, a student? Oh, excellent. <laughs> Bishop McElroy, thank yes. you so much. Sure. Um, my name is Emily Kate. I'm a junior here at Loyola and a Catholic Studies minor. Um, my uh, almost entire year this year has been focused a lot on um, youth's impact of the church, so how young people are impacting the church. And I think it's something that we've now seen bleed over into politics is a big movement of young people um, with the March for Our Lives, um, as well as the Mar Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting that's kind of mobilized this um, hope and uh, movement within young people in our political scheme. Um, so my question to you is, um, with the uh, Synod of Youth coming up in September, um, what can the church do to bring, as you said, the uh, Catholic political imagination to our young people? Um, and then how can they further influence not only our political understanding of the United States, but of the world? Uh, I, I think the Synod is, is just enormously important in the life of the church because uh, unless we can find ways of engaging with the millennial generation, it's going to be a greatly crippled church moving forward. So on the wider, widest issue, it seems to me this, this endeavor coming up is, and what will flow from it is central. Uh, as, as to, um, I'm hoping for the increasing involvement of young people in politics. I remember when I studied uh, politics in the empirical sense when I was going to graduate school, so often engagement had to do with a sense of perceived efficacy. The more you were engaged as if you felt what you were doing was going to have consequences. And that's why, for example, it, where I am, Hispanic uh, voting is low because there's a prolonged multi-generational sense that they have not been effective for a variety of structural reasons. But, so my hope is that young people, the, the way I think we can help it, and help foment this is, is, is helping have a sense of participation. I think you had the march, okay, and, and uh, those have been wonderful moments of involvement of young people. And I just hope and pray that that can be broken down and followed up on at the local level. So the more the church can do to encourage young people 
to participate and then hopefully have an, have an effect. Because efficacy is it, it's what always, when I, I said I voted the first time I was 18. When I was 18, there was a reason people voted when you were 18. And that was when I was uh, 18 years old, the war in Vietnam was still going on. So one day we watched on a lottery as our number was drawn out whether we would be drafted the next year or not. And you'd go, so you, you had a stake. So people did vote. But I hope that's, that's true of, 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 of the, the generation that's coming to war now. But I think efficacy is the important part of it. Are you content? Yes. <laughs> uh, this question here, and then we'll do one more, and then I'll do that. Great. All right, well, I'm not taking if there's a young person who wants to talk, just raise your hand because I don't want to take your place. But I got three of them myself. Two thirties. Well, I was going to say, what do you mean you aren't young? Yeah. Well, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So no, I've got three young people. Yeah. And uh, one of the things about Catholic imagination is it's just not about virtue. It's also and and not it's not virtue first and then action later. Catholic imagination has always been virtue and action at the same time. And grow from the action of the virtue. Yeah. And so I think it's important if you're talking about Catholic imagination, we don't just limit it to making us better people, but also we cover some of the things in the Catholic, especially the US Catholic history about organizing at the grassroots level, support of unions, support of uh, grassroots community organizations, a lot of other things like that. And I'm just gonna tell a quick story. My daughter is 30 and she uh, goes and volunteers down at the Cook County Jail for Women. And uh, after about the second time down there, she came back and she said, Dad, I'm really upset. I said, well, what's going on? And she said, well, those women, some of whom were in there for years, waiting for, for their case to come up, get the same bologna and American cheese on two slices of white bread sandwich every day, 365 days a year. What can I do about it? And my reaction, coming out of the Catholic tradition, is, well, you better join a church. He said, well, what, why would I have to join a church? I said, because you're really not going to be able to do anything about those sandwiches unless you get some other people on your side. And do you know what she did? She spent four or five weekends going to the various churches and finally found one, and now she's going to try to get them to help change the diet at the Cook County Jail. Yes, I, I wholly agree. Imagination divorced from action is useless. All right. I mean, it's better than divisiveness, but it's not much. To, it's, it's it's not much better. So that there, there there has to be the action. I'm not sure the Christian imagination or Catholic imagination is the right framework to use. I I, I use it because I like the term. I'm not sure it's the apt term for what I'm getting at. I just like it because of its historical meaning and that it points to the affective and something that draws you to it rather than something that cognitively convinces you. Thank you both. A question here? Hello, Bishop. Uh, I'm not a theology major, my name is Erica. So uh, I was really affected by the doctor when she mentioned um, that since 2015, a lot has changed in our political landscape, and you also mentioned that the broad middle has dropped out, and uh, I wanted to address that uh, you haven't mentioned that we live in an age of secularity, in an, an age yeah. of individualism, and how that affects us, and how that uh, a broad middle is really forced into a spot where they have to focus on providing for their family, getting their kids through school, and they don't have time to really look into what political platforms are based in what, uh, even time to go to mass, time to have these dialogues, and be called to peacemaking. So my question to you is, um, how can we find an outward sense of peace among each other when an inward sense of peace is so difficult to grasp? I, I think you're right. The, the, the communitarian uh, strain in our, in, our, in our cultural life is diminished, and that's a great loss, uh, much beyond the political. Um, and and it, it's hard to recover that, but we need to try to keep recovering that. But 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 that's that that, that is hard to recover. Um, I think though the the um, uh, 
I think we need to find a way to move forward. It's not clear to me how things are going to unfold over the next couple of years. There could be a huge collapse of what, I, I don't mean the whole country collapse, I just mean a political collapse and starting over, you know, where, where we, we, we all come to a point, or most come to a point, we need to do things differently. And I'm hoping we come to a point where we think we need to do things differently. Um, uh, but I'm not clear that we're not going to be in a series, you mentioned since 2015, a series of, of waves that continue the trajectory we're on. Uh, the secularities is, is a significant part of it. Um, but uh, some of the most troubling is, you know, has been pointed out, some of the most troubling issues and, and movements and voices have been from religious perspectives, you know, which, which is, which is, uh, which is harsh. I mean, within our society, if you look at the voting patterns, there, there's some real uh, difficult things, but, but a lot of it comes to from what people are willing to overlook to stay with their part, to what their party trajectory is. And I just want to give you one counter example that really is very helpful. There was a, a group called the Circle of Concern that was built up about eight or nine years ago. And their sole perspective, it was a group of, it was the Catholic Bishops Conference, the Evangelicals, it was secular groups, but it, it was an umbrella group and they, they had one concern they all came together on, everybody did. And these were a cross-partisan divide, I'll tell you. Uh, that they were going to protect in the budget children from being cut through. And all the sequestration, all these ridiculous things have gone on in this period of time. And they were able to do it effectively. They, they made a lot of progress on it because that was their one objective. So there are common cause uh, objectives and coalitions that can be formed and are realistic and that call people to go beyond their the head of the evangelical, though the head of the white evangelicals who had to do this, he took a lot of flack for this, but he did it because he, he felt that was a cause. So it's that sort of thing that I think we could move toward. Yeah. Yeah. Decently content. Okay. <laughs> I could satisfy with that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Well, Bishop Appleby, we have a special gift for you. Someone to invite Father Jim oh. Green, Father Green's Vice President of Mission, and Rector of the Jesuit community. And Father Green, what do you have? I don't know if you follow basketball. Yes, but I sure do. Unfortunately, yes. you can actually use this now. Uh, but the plan is that you're going to need it next basketball season. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank Mr. McElroy for being here.